Okay. So let's have a chat tonight. I'm not going to teach. <laughs> All right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. The entrance of your word brings light. Today we are gathered here as children of light because you are the father of lights. Your word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. Help us to grow as a church, as individuals in the word of God. We submit, we surrender, Lord. Give us the spirit of wisdom and of understanding. Give us the spirit of revelation that we may grow in the knowledge of you. Lord, as I speak today, let it not be me or whoever speaks, but let it be the spirit of a father speaking through us. We bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. What are some of your struggles when it comes to your faith walk? What is your biggest struggle? In your walk, you know, you, you, you walk with God. We talk about Christian faith, going to church, being a Christian. What does it mean to you? Is it attending church on a Sunday? <coughs> Why do we come to church? You know, what does Christian faith mean to you? Yes. Huh? Lower it? Okay. And, I mean, see, Christianity is, is not a religion, right? It has to become a reality for each and every one of us. Um, it has to be lived. It has, you have to experience the Zoe life. Alright? But in your walk, Obviously, you're going to face challenges. Um, you know, it's a continuous, conscious living. But many times we don't, we're not conscious of that. We forget it. We come to church, we are reminded. So, what are some of your challenges? Like, in your Christian walk, what is your challenge? What, like, some people may say, oh, "I'm too lazy spiritually," <laughs> or some people say, oh, "I can't read the Bible." Uh, some last Friday, some you know somebody said they got delivered from not able to speak in tongues and reading the Bible. They said I haven't been able to read the Bible for four years. Every time I open the Bible and read, it's blurry. And God delivered him on Friday, just as I was speaking. God delivered him, and he goes, "I'm loving reading the Word." You see, so there are different challenges and. Struggles people go through, right? That was one interesting challenge that he went through. So, can you share what what challenges you might have? Um, raising kids yeah. that are not yet have an encounter mm. and trying to get the right balance between authority and grace. Mm. the fear of God, I found the challenge between the two. Mm -hmm. I understand. Raising kids can be a bit of a challenge. Now, I was just talking to my wife actually today about what is a biblical way to raise kids, you know, with all that gentle parenting going around on social media. <laughs> Have, are you familiar with gentle parenting, right? Yeah. I call it the spreading. <laughs> 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 um, gentle parenting and all that and I just looked at it and I go yes and no you know yes we're supposed to be gentle but I think you draw the line in some places you know I think for kids we're not more than f we are not friends alone we're parents you know so you have to place yourself as in a place of authority they need to know that you're in you're in charge they are not in charge, very clear. In my house, my son is not in charge. You know, even though he tries to push boundaries, I 
put my foot down. You are not in charge. I am in charge. Mom's in charge. And even mom follows a line of command. There's a chain of command. It, it starts with Jesus, then, then dad, and then mom. That's how it is. Um, unfortunately, sometimes we want to be kids' friends, you know. Then that's, uh, uh, generally speaking, you know, generally a lot of times. But they also want to push the boundaries, push the boundaries. But biblical, what is a biblical way? The Bible says impress the word of God into their lives. So you have to keep impressing, keep impressing God's word. You have to raise them around the word and not force, but at the same time be firm, you know. Um, they can receive the word in different ways. For example, when I say pray, he's praying, but he's also jumping around. You know, at that time, I'm trying to get him to be still. But as a five-year-old, he wants to jump around while praying. <laughs> you know, so, but he's still around. So before I used to say, no, be still, but he can't. So I try to sort of be around that. But most importantly, we need to model it. Modeling, you know. Um, we need to model Christianity for some people, especially kids. We need to model. Um, so modeling can be like, like we were talking about, the way we talk, the way we do things, the way we react to things. They learn more from observing how we do it than what we tell them. So I think we need more grace and patience. When it comes to kids, you need more grace and patience and lay hands on them every day. Lay hands on their, on their head. Speak over them that the enemy will not touch them. One thing I've learned is this. When children are born, um, yes, when, you're, when you are a believer, the Bible says because of a believing mother, the child is clean. Okay? So which means through your salvation, your children become cleans, you know. No, no, the, the thing is, are they born again? That's different. Okay. We need to still tell them about being saved and being born again because Christ needs to be resurrected in their hearts. They need to be resurrected with Christ, right? They need to come into that reality. So it is important as much as the word is being taught to them, they need to understand the importance of being born again. Now, before that happens, they can be all over the place. So don't, uh, you know, just think that's because they're your kids and your Christian and going to church, they have also become born again. We have to teach them what it is to be born again they are still individuals who have to make a decision and a choice to accept Jesus in their lives. So right from a young age, we need to keep telling them, impressing the gospel. So important because as we are telling, the world is also fighting for their attention. Fighting for their attention. Schools, I'm telling you, even in schools, like you can, they can go to the best Christian school. Uh-uh. Who don't know what is being fed. Not just by the school, but also by the, the kids around them. Because the, the, the kids there might be Christian kids, but you don't know how, what type of language the father speaks at home. You see? They might be, might be swearing at home, and he's picking up things, and he's swearing in front of your kids. You know? And um, so we need to put boundaries. Boundaries are so important. And you have to keep impressing, keep, I'll tell you it's the hard work, but you have to keep impressing the word of God. So it has to go with the word of God, prayer, praying together, praying for them. And then continuously teach the word of God. Continuously teach. What saved me was the word that was impressed in my heart when I was a young boy. Not forcing me to go to church. Forcing discipline in my life, I'm, I'm glad for it today, <laughs> okay? Because I still carry the discipline until today. So I'm glad. I'm glad that my father 
and mother pushed discipline. You see, I didn't like it. I didn't like it. Maybe the method could have been a little bit different. They could have, you know, could have whacked me a little less. <laughs> but that's a non-negotiable where I grow, where I come from. You see, that's a, in, in there. You know, you can't say I'm going to call child services. And there's still ten minutes for child services to get before <laughs> somebody gets hurt. <laughs> so, <coughs> you know, so in India, if they whack you and the neighbor hears, they will also come and whack you. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so the whole neighborhood raises you. It's like that. It's you, 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 you are expected to be tough, um, but uh, but that's not the biblical way. You know, you don't beat your <laughs> children. Um, discipline is important. Some Christians take the discipline to another extreme, where they say the rod of correction, and then they beat. That's not biblical as well, right? Um, so the rod and the staff they comfort me. So when the Bible talks about um, do not spare the rod, what is it talking about? Are you supposed to have a rod in your house as a Christian <laughs> and, and beat when they make a mistake? So what does it say? What does it mean when the Bible says do not spare the, the rod? The rod is the correction. Okay, for example, David is a shepherd. A shepherd will usually have a staff and a rod. Okay? The staff was used to pull down leaves where the sheep could not reach. So as a shepherd, they would use that staff. The staff had the, the curve. So they would pull it down to feed the sheep when there was no grass so there was no food. And the rod was usually kept to protect the sheep, not to beat the sheep. So if a wolf comes, what do they do? Use the rod. Or if they go to, so, so for example, if the sheep go to the side into the ditch, they will beat the ditch until the sheep came back into. So your firmness, your correction. So I've seen some, sometimes some parents with a kid, ah, oh, he's just a baby, you know, I don't have to correct him. No, it's not, you have to. You have to bring the discipline. If you don't bring the discipline, they'll go to the ditch. The rod is not to beat, but to stop them from growing in, going into that. So you give them a choice. You know what? You go there, this is what's going to happen. This is my rule. As long as you stay in my house, this is my rule. This is what it is. You have a choice to accept it. What does God do with us? You have life and you have death choose life so you have to practical choice you have to give as young as they are they will try to the sin nature will try to overrule whether you like it or no matter how cute they are how small they are the sin nature will try to take over until the word begins to grow in them it takes time so it takes time. Don't allow anybody else to parent your children. You parent them. You have to teach. You have to teach. It's not the church. It's not the school. It is in the house. Always. Okay? And we have to draw boundaries. Who they're listening to. Who their friends are. Uh, what they're watching. Reading. Everything has to be monitored. Um, we have to monitor everything. Especially in today's world. You have to monitor everything. What TV shows they're watching? YouTube. Mm -mm, no screen time. Zero. <laughs> if you ask me, keep it zero. Very minimal. So we have to draw boundaries so that the enemy doesn't come in. So it will be the most challenging thing. But the more and more God's word is impressed in their hearts, you know, um, Especially for me, I'm always very conscious because they say, pastor's kids. I'm like, no, I rebuke that in Jesus' name. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not about that. You know, I, I know a man of God. He's a um, well-known apostle in India. Both his kids um, are in the ministry, right? His, his son, older son and younger daughter. He, the older son is maybe around 26, 27 years, 28 years old. 
uh, owns multiple businesses, um, ma major ministry, very successful, and loves the Lord, and is a, is a big evangelist in India. And I spoke to this man of God and I asked him, Sir, what was your secret? Um, he told me, I impressed the word into his life. I took him and I showed him. And he said, <laughs> he never used to let his kids go to Sunday school, by the way. <laughs> he said when he preached, his son would sit there and listen to him preach. Listen to him preach. Hear the word. Hear the word. Hear the word. Today he's a preacher. 28, 29 years old, he's a preacher. Every meeting, hundreds of people give their life to Jesus. Now he moved to America, he settled down there, he's married. I mean, that guy is just living the life for Jesus. I said, what was your secret? He said, I took him with me everywhere I went. I didn't let anyone teach him. I impressed the word of God into his heart. His daughter, you should see, in his church, he's got a massive church in India. His daughter will be walking around. The daughter will call out cases. In the church, he'll say, you, you're going through this, you're going through this. You can even call out names. Sharp prophetic voice. They kept it close. Kept teaching the word. Teaching the word. Teaching the word. I'm telling you, it's the word of God. You have to impress the word of God. You have to lay hands on them. And you have to pray for them. Pray with them. And most importantly, covering. The covering needs to be there. Yeah? I hope that answers. Right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. And you can see the enemy at work. And yeah. So you yeah. Yeah. See, once the child gets married, they have they started their own family. Mm -hmm. They're not under your covering anymore. Um they have left so for example the bible says uh, for this reason a man shall leave his father it doesn't say the, the woman is leaving. who leaves the man leaves and he cleaves to the to the woman so when the man leaves why is he leaving his father's house because he's not a boy anymore he has been sent out to be a man right so he now is expected to start his own clan his own family. So one of the things that I tell people is their family, right? Father, mother, children. It's a family. Once the son leaves, he starts his own family. He, begin, he becomes a priest and the king in his domain. He has to now lead his family. In that case, if are they saved? You know, the, the, the literal is Christian family. And yeah. Christian. Christian. Yes. More like a... Uh, but, but there's still some, some people in the literal is Christian family. There's an assumption yeah. that they're saved. Yeah. There's no word there. Yeah. So this, 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 that's the problem, right? There's so many Christians, but no word. Mm -hmm. So because there is a lack of word, people don't know how to actually raise a Christian family, raise Christian kids, and follow the principles of the Bible. Now, you might have lived like that before, so you did not impress the word to your children, and then now, you know, they've gone. There is still grace. There is still grace. You see, there is still grace. Why? Because as a parent, you are still connected to them. Even though they have started their own family, you are still connected to them. You are still connected to them. That means the, the blessing of the Father is still there. You see. Um, generations are blessed, right? So the, ideally speaking, we raise Christian family, Christian sons and daughters. They grow. The Father blesses them. 
and then releases them. Now what we do, modern day, they turn 18, leave the house. Okay? Unfortunately, that's not the biblical pattern. Unfortunately, okay? That's the Western pattern, okay? The biblical pattern, the Bible says a father, what does he do? Leaves a inheritance for his children. Unfortunately, fathers today don't leave an inheritance. See? We have to leave inheritance. Do you understand what I mean? Spiritual and natural. What we do, 18, you go and fend for yourself. That guy has to start from scratch. Why do a lot of people say we don't want children? Because it doesn't, uh, it's not for our lifestyle. So what kind of lifestyle you want to have that you don't want to have children? <laughs> do you understand? So you see the whole mindset around children. The Bible says that children are a blessing from God. And, in, and if you don't see children as blessing, you, they will always be a baggage. That means every time it is difficult to raise them, you will look at them as troublesome. So the attitude with which you deal with them will always be, you're, you're interfering with what I'm supposed to do. What else are you supposed to do? The Bible clearly says, if a man does not rule over his own home, he's not fit for, for the kingdom, for the ministry. That means ministry starts where first? It starts at home. It starts at home. But we have been taught that you have to look after yourself. And we are, what, what do parents do? We plan for our retirement. But the kingdom way, look at it. Look at the Bible. Nobody planned for their retirement. They planned passing on the baton. They planned how the sons will receive inheritance, both the blessing, spiritual, and the material. It was passed on. It was passed on. That means sons and daughters must be able to build on the platform we built for them. Not start from scratch. You see, but what do we do? We want them to start from scratch. So they go out into the world, it's difficult. We all just start from scratch, it's very difficult. When I looked in the Bible, the Bible clearly says a good father leaves a inheritance. But many fathers don't plan for inheritance. 18, you leave, you go work, you pay. You pay. You teach them. There's nothing wrong with teaching them how to take care of the bills in the house and paying the rent. There's nothing wrong with that. If you, if you teach them how to do that, they will be more responsible. Okay? But, oh God, give me the grace to talk. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Yeah. But it's not meant to be. It's not meant to be. The whole world system <coughs> is designed for children to leave after a certain age. But he checked the Bible. The children stayed until they got married. See, we have this whole dating culture. Right? Where you date, 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 
and then if it works out, it works out, and then we'll get married. When I was 15 years old, my mother started talking to me about getting married. And she kept telling me, you will only marry God's will. She kept tell, drilling it into my heart. So much so. So before I met Pastor Uncle, I had a few matches. Right? So I like this girl. I like you know, or this one. This sister, this sister, this. Very nice potential, this, that. And then my, my spiritual father will say, okay, this one, that one. And the only thing I asked was, is it God's will? Is it God's will? But we are not taught like that. We are told, whoever you choose will be God's will. God will speak to you. See, sometimes it works out, it's fine, okay? But we also need to teach people that, hey, that's the most important decision of your life. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. So better seek God's guidance when it comes to that most dis important decision of your life. So this whole dating culture, what we do, we don't plan for our children. We don't train them. We don't, how do I put it? Get them ready for what they're supposed to do. So when they get to a certain age, they go off relationship, relationship. As, as young as 15 people are in relationships. It baffles me. What do you know at 15? So because of that, what happens now? They want to go out and do their own thing. That's the culture. Unfortunately, we live in a culture like that. Is that the Bible culture? It's not. Oh, we do it differently here, Pastor. Uh, I'm not, no, no, listen, I'm not talking about Indian culture or Western culture or any of that thing. So even Indian culture, there are many things that are not right. I don't go by Indian culture. I go by the kingdom culture. When my parents said, we'll look for a girl, I said, no, God will show me. Why? Because my mother kept drilling into my spirit, God's will, God's will, God's will. She kept drilling it. You will only marry God's will. As young as 15 years old. So by the time I was growing up, I had many temptations of getting into relationships. Even with Christians, girls in my church, I will go and pray. And the Lord will say, no, I will reject them. He said, no, that's not God's will for you. You see, out there, no, that's not one for me. That's not the one for me. That's not the one for me. That's not the one for me. Until I met my wife and the Lord said, that's the one. So I was never, when I became a Christian, I was not walking around dating. You know, I did try. But like, oh, is this the one? Is this the one? But it was impressed in my heart. So we need to impress into your children to follow God's will. Right? So that when they get to the certain age, they're not waiting to leave to get into relationships. But they stay in the father's house and leave when they are ready. That's how it's meant to be. Okay? That's how it's meant to be. So what happens if you're not done that and they've gone and they've started their own families and they've forgotten about you or they don't call you? Unfortunately, you made some decisions that led to that place but God can still heal, correct? God's grace is still there. Do you believe? Yeah. So now, what you got to do is and go and tell God, God, I'm sorry I didn't know. That's what my father did. In fact, he called me two days ago and he told me he was sorry. He told me, I wanted the best for you, but I'm sorry I didn't know how to present it to you. Two days ago, he called me. Why? Because he's in now in a church that's holding a conference and teaching men to be men. And he got convicted and he called me and he told me, I am so sorry that I did these things to you and I didn't realize how much I was hurting you. I said, Dad, it's okay. 
But he did something when he almost lost me. There came a time in his life where he thought I was a hopeless situation. My parents really thought I was a hopeless situation. Look, I was, I was the worst son I, any parent could ever have. You can't imagine that, I know. But to have me as a parent was a burden. My mother will cry every day. My father washed his hands of me. He said, this one is a hopeless case. At least your children are better. <laughs> your pastor was a hopeless case. That's why it's a testimony. I was a hopeless case because my heart was, heart was so hard. See, the reason why I became like that is a different story, okay? Because what happened, we went to a very Pentecostal church that didn't teach a lot of life lessons. They were all about pray, 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 pray. But they never talked about practical things. They never taught about relationship with God and with others. They didn't talk about integrity. So people will talk and preach something and then they would behave a certain way at home. So they asked kids, we saw that and we said, that's hypocrisy. So we hated church, we hated what our parents were telling us and we didn't want to do it. When you make a mistake, accept it, own it. My son sometimes tells me, Dad, you said this, but you I say, yeah, I know, I'm sorry. My dad would never say sorry to me. I've never heard him say sorry to me. Never. Not once. Not once told me he loves me. It will not, he will not tell me he, he loves me. I tell my son I love him every day. <laughs> but he never told me. I wanted his attention. I wanted his approval. But he never told me. So I had to grow up in such a way that I didn't want anybody's approval. See, so now, you know, now I've, like, I've become like, I don't need anyone's <laughs> approval to do what I have to do. But see, it would have been better to grow in a healthy environment, right? So I didn't have a healthy environment. The healthy environment came when I went away to the Philippines. So God had to take me away from my family because it was toxic at that time. And then he gave me a spiritual family where I had to relearn things with a spiritual father who had a strong character. So I was really strong because I became like a stone. So then my spiritual father had to teach me how to have a compassionate heart. You see, so then the Lord started breaking me, you know. Sometimes, when your children go through breaking, leave them. It's God dealing with them. Yeah, at this, I just wanted to remind you. You tell God, if it is God who is bringing, through the, bringing breaking for them, don't pray against it. Leave them to God. Yeah, I just received a word for you. When they go through crisis, don't stop it. It might be God trying to teach them a lesson. I know as a father you want to step in and teach them all the right things. But I feel in my spirit they're going to see. See one of the words I gave you was your family is going to start noticing the difference that God is making in your life. And he's going to reestablish you and they're going to come back and ask you how you did it. So as I am speaking now. One of the things my dad did was surrender me to God. You can't cover them now, but you can surrender them to God. Don't warfare for them. Okay? Because it might be just God trying to make them... Okay. Jonah was thrown into the sea, right? No amount of prayer could have saved him. Right? No amount of prayer. Imagine, okay, now the storm is coming. Jonah knew he was the problem, correct? Do you think he would have prayed to God? 100% he would have prayed. Did God answer his prayer? No, the storm didn't stop. God did not answer his prayer. Until he owned up to his mistake and he was thrown into the sea. Sometimes the storms come so that they can surrender themselves to what God was to do. Same with your daughter. It is not a hopeless case. 
I had to go through my own storms away from my parents so I could learn. And that's usually one of the ways I know God deals with a person. He allows the storms so that they now see you and realize, how do you have that peace? Please tell me that. Tell me, Mom. So sometimes, some people, when they go through storms, you ask God, God, is that storm something that I should pray against? Because you might just be interfering with God's dealing with somebody's life. Let them be. Even Paul himself, he said, what? Hand him over to you. That's an extreme case in which a guy was very hard-headed and, and, and sleeping with someone he shouldn't be sleeping with. What did Paul say? Hand him over to Satan. What does it mean? So that For the destruction of his body so that he, he will not lose his, his soul, his spirit. Which means don't cover him. Let him be in that sin so much that it destroys him. Okay, in his flesh, because you're going to feel it after a while. Let him be. Let him, let him feel the pain of that sin until he comes to realization and comes back running to God. So that we save his soul. Pray for their salvation. Pray for them to know Jesus. But say, Lord, if this is a storm you're bringing, Lord, like Jonah, <laughs> let them realize and they will, re they will notice the hand of God upon your life. And they will say, Dad, can you pray for us? That's when you step in. You see, God is a God of second chances. So it's amazing. Your children are not hopeless. Okay? Oh, I should have done this. Should have. I'm, I'm just talking to you about how it should be. But if you didn't, there is still a, there is still grace. Okay, so as I'm talking, I'm just getting a prophetic word for you. It is settled. You stand and be still and know that God is at work. Because if you too are with God and walking in grace and the presence of God is in your life, the Bible says that you and your household shall be saved. But if someone's heart is hardened, expect storms. You're not going through storms. <laughs> you went through it and you came out of it. Now you're praying for your family. Let God deal with them. Step aside and see. Okay? But when it comes to parenting now, that's, that's a different thing. Okay? That's your ch ch chance one. <laughs> if you miss your chance one, there's chance two. <laughs> Chance three, chance four. So what my dad did, I still remember, he surrendered me to God. He said, Lord, I surrender this boy to you. He's not mine, he's yours. I can't do it. He's like, this guy is hopeless. <laughs> it won't change. Yes, yes, they cried, they prayed, nothing happened. The moment he surrendered me to God, that's the... That's the week the attack on my life was the most severe. My soul left my body. And I went, I was almost entering hell. And I saw myself entering hell. And I cried out to Jesus. And I went, and okay, Jesus came and saved my soul. Yeah. And right after which my salvation came, I gave my life to Jesus, cut off from everything. And then went back full. I went back full, 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 full on for Jesus. Sold out for Jesus. That's it. So by the time I was 21, 22, I was completely sold out. I said, no, no turning back. So I've never turned back ever since. And I've cleaned up, cleaned up my life, cleaned up everything, total, you know, cleaned up my mess. But it still took, God still took me out of my home. And took me to a different place. Yeah. Um, but after that, my dad realized and then he said, I need to, you know, be there and support you. So up till the day I got, he was there. He stood by my side. But in the emotional sense, it took another 10 years for him to realize. <laughs> okay. 
All right. There is still grace. That's the that's the essence today. There is still grace. There is still grace. Your children are not hopeless. The father says, your children, I'm, I'm prophesying to you today. I'm prophesying to some of you today. Your children are not hopeless. If that's a word for you, can you say amen to that? Amen. Father, I pray and I release, Lord, these children into your hands, Lord. No weapon fashioned against them shall prosper. Lord, the enemy will not snatch them from them, O Lord. Lord, because they are coming, they are serving you, they are coming and seeking you. Lord, let grace, let there be supernatural salvation in all these families, Lord. Children coming back to the Lord in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, there's a prophetic word in, in the Bible, right? Children's hearts will be turned back to the fathers. Let 2024 be that for you. Yes. Listen, right? if your children are far from the Lord, write that verse down. Write that verse down. Speak that over your children. Children's hearts will be turned back to the fathers. And, and also, if you have a father and your relationship has been bad, forgive your father. Okay? Even if he's passed on, forgive him. Okay? Don't hold hard grudges. Release for the sake of the blessing for your children. Even if your father's died, it doesn't matter. Release it. Father, whatever things he did, uh, release forgiveness. Mm? It is well. Call it. Anyone else? Some real talk tonight. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a very important thing. That's a very important thing for every Christian to remember. <coughs> um, you know, hopefully I can talk on the principles of prayer one day, very soon. Um, but what Peter was saying is like, you know, did, you, did you hear him? Yeah? So, <coughs> basically, the persistence in prayer you know, some things happen right away. Some things take time. Um, but it's also for important for us to understand the principle of prayer, why we pray. Um, you know, I think sometimes we mash prayer into one lump, you know. Uh, but we need to understand the different types of prayer, 
How many of you know the different types of prayers? Yeah? Okay. I think I've taught on this before, but I'll touch on it again soon. Proper, I'll do it again. <laughs> um, so basically, you know, the persistence in prayer is something so important as a Christian. We can't give up. Because Jesus also talks about the woman who kept going and what? Knocking and knocking and knocking until she received an answer. Okay? Certain prayers are like that. Certain prayers, he, you, answer, you ask, God answers. Certain prayers, you have to go persistent, consistently ask. Now, I asked the Lord some time back. Okay. The first time I ever fasted, the Lord asked me to fast seven days. Okay, the first time in my life I ever fasted, I said, oh God, seven days, no food. Anyway, <laughs> and the Lord said, I want to, I, I needed some answers. Okay, so I went into fasting. Um, this is when I first got saved and I wanted to know, ask God, God, what is my calling? <coughs> I wanted to know 100% if I was called or not. Uh, because the prophecy came, um, there were other, uh, you know, things that confirmed that I was called and said Lord okay you've called me but what is my calling is it the fivefold is it ministry what do you want me to do Lord and I entered into this the Lord said go into fast seven day fast I heard him and I said okay I'm going to go fast seven days that time I didn't know how to hear God from scripture I could hear him in my spirit but I didn't know how to hear him in the from the scripture uh, I remember a dear friend of mine taught me this he told me, you need to hear God from scripture, Samuel. Uh, you need to have, like what Peter said, a quickened word in your spirit in order for you to stand on it. Don't just go by the still small voice in your spirit. Yes, it's good. You're able to hear God. But it's a different level when you receive a word from scripture. Because that word will become something is a foundation stone which you s you hold on to that word is quickened by the holy spirit for you to hold on to so you see something's got to be an answer right away but this one required a quickened word from the holy spirit through scripture that's the same thing with my marriage as well when i was about to marry my wife i knew she was the one the holy spirit spoke to my spirit i received the still small voice but I still took time to fast, go back to scripture. Why? Because my friend taught me this principle. That's why I'm teaching you now. <laughs> I just follow it for the, my life and whatever I follow, I just teach. Okay? So it's not like some I have some textbook somewhere. <laughs> okay? Your, your life principles that you learn become the things that you teach. So whatever you apply in your life, you need to go and teach people. So that they can be empowered. So this dear friend of mine told me, he said, you need a quickened word from the scripture, Samuel. You have to get the word. <coughs> I said, all right. I went into fasting and prayer, seven days. Believe it or not, the Lord spoke to me about a lot of things, but he never told me anything about my call. <laughs> he was dealing with so many things, right? He was dealing with so many things, my character, my birth. I was, hey. He was breaking me, he was teaching me, he was showing me, he was saying, you got to leave this, you got to do this. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> but never spoke about my call until the seventh day. A few hours before I was going to finish my call, the word came from the book of Timothy, 2 Timothy. I'll never forget, chapter number 4. But you, my dear son, do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill all duties of the ministry. Bam! I stood up from my seat. I said, Masakata. It entered my spirit. The Lord was saying, My son, do the work of the ministry. Do the work of an evangelist. So I started as an evangelist. I went, I said, Lord, your word has come. It has proceeded from the throne room. Yes, it's in front of me in the Bible, but I knew the word proceeded from the throne room even before I was created, waiting to enter into me the moment I read it. So there came a moment in time in, chrono, in Kronos, 
Because God doesn't speak in Kronos, by the way. He speaks in Kairos. Do you know the difference between Kronos and Kairos? Kronos is the chronological time. Okay? Yesterday, today, tomorrow. Okay? Past, present, future. That is Kronos. Now it is 8.15. In two minutes it will be 8.17. Kronos. God doesn't speak like that. Don't think God is going to speak to you tomorrow. What God wants to speak to you tomorrow, he has already spoken. Did you get that? What God is going to speak to you tomorrow, he has already spoken. You haven't received it yet. So God is not like waiting, oh, are you listening? I'm going to talk now. He's already spoken his word. He's already released everything concerning your life. See, intimacy is different. In intimacy, when you talk with God, that's different. But when it comes to the things concerning your life, it has already been mapped out. The word concerning your life has already been released. Concerning your life, your future, everything that needs for your life and godliness, that word has already been, he's been released. He's not going to come, he's been released. You just have to simply fine tune and go into the word for you to know what has been released to you. It's like this, if I told you a blueprint is available for your life and it's locked up somewhere, I'm telling you, you will. See, if I tell you it costs about $10,000 for you to get your blueprint, I'm telling you, everyone will try to find $10,000 to somehow get the blueprint for your life. Right? But it's already there. All you have to do is read the Bible and pray in the Holy Ghost. And spend a little time with him every day so that the blueprint is released to you. But we don't do that. Because we think reading the Bible is just knowing some history lessons. Man, your blueprint is there. Your life map, who you're going to marry, what's going to happen. Every, your ministry, your call, everything is in the word. The prophet, as a prophet, if I, if my, my wife and I, if I just come and say, I, we're just confirming what God has already spoken. Until you come in contact with the spoken word from the written word, from the graphe, the quickening will not happen in your spirit. The quickening happens the moment the word comes out of scripture, gets into your spirit and then you've gotten it. In the spirit realm, until you've seen it, until you've heard it, it doesn't belong to you. Because faith cometh by hearing. Faith is the currency to possess your possessions. So which means your prayer life, as much as intimacy with God is important, that waiting on God to receive a word is so important. So let's say praying for children, praying for whatever you're praying for. Let's say God asks you to fast and pray. I ask God, why did you take seven days? Because he said to me, if I gave you the word the first day, you would have stopped praying. I wanted to keep you to myself because yes. I wanted to teach you more valuable lessons and I enjoyed your intimacy more because I didn't want you to come to me as a transaction. So that day I learned another valuable lesson. I don't go to, go for God. I don't go to God for a transaction. You go to God as transaction, I'm telling you, you will not receive anything. Oh, it's a principle. I'm going to apply the principle. You failed already. It doesn't work like that. Imagine I, I, I'm trying to make, I'm, I'm trying to have a relationship with you based on what you can give me. Will you like it? <laughs> that's, that's business, that's transactional. But yet we do that with God. I've done my giving, Lord where is my harvest? It didn't come, so what? What if God decides not to give you a harvest? Will you still be will you still worship him? Many of them can't. Oh, but 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 according to the principle, I've done it and I've not received what I was supposed to receive. It's my right. <laughs> then you forgot sonship. You've forgotten what it is to really be a son. Your mind has to go from transaction to relationship. Amen. Yes, there are principles, but the position with which you approach that principle is, is important. Don't approach principles from a place of transaction. Approach principles from a, from a place of relationship. Amen. Amen. 
So don't fast because I want power, Lord. I want anointing, Lord. No, Lord, I want to fast because you've called me. See, fasting is an invitation. I don't go into fasting without invitation. He invites me. And when he invites me, I say, Lord, I'm forsaking all so that my heart is turned towards you. In that place of fasting, Lord, I want to humble myself, put my pride aside so that I can hear you clearly, Lord. So that the flesh is not fed and my spirit can hear. It is not a transaction. So in that place, your heart is kept pure. Your heart is like, Lord, I'm not coming here because I want an answer, Lord. I'm coming here because I want to hear you. And then he deals with things. He deals with things. And then finally, by the way, here you go. Amen? But we don't have the patience, right? So we want quick. Oh, I prayed. I sowed. I want this. You know, certain things I sowed nine, ten years ago. They happened ten years later. I received the harvest ten years later. How do you, how do you explain that? Oh, I did this now. Let it happen tomorrow in one... <coughs> Forget about it. Sow it and forget about it. If you're still thinking about your seed, you're never, you're never really sowed. What is seed? You sow, you cover the ground, you forget about it. What's a gift? You give, you forget about it. You give somebody a gift and then you call them. So I hope you are taking good care of my gift. <laughs> you are still holding on to it. You've never really given. Your heart is not there in the giving. Your heart is more in the principle. As much as principles are important, don't be driven by principle. Amen? Don't make it a business transaction. Don't make it corporate. Church is different from corporate. It's not a business. The principles are very similar, but we are love driven. Amen? So, you have to go persist and ask. So sometimes some answers take time because God is preparing and building your character through the process. Because your process is more important than the result for God. For you, the result is very important. For God, your heart is more important. Amen? Shall we finish? Or any other questions, any other things you want to share? Something happened went from from my heart to my uh, uh, waist. Never happened like this before. It was like a like a shot of electricity. I went for um, a scan. They can't find a thing. Nothing. Praise God. And I'm just like, oh yeah, maybe they they cracked it and yeah. Mm -hmm. There was a cyst in this kidney. The cyst is gone as well. Praise God. <laughs> So through it all, <coughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. There was another frequency at work. Yeah. When did this happen? Uh, 
pain was. No, no, you felt something go through your body. Two weeks prior, because last Friday I was here, I was awake. Friday night prayer. Yeah. I'm telling you, Friday night prayers, people. Yeah. When we don't even drill lesson, you know, he got healed. I was just like standing wow. here. Yeah. We, that was really intense. Uh, my, uh, you, you my legs like yeah. And then all of a sudden, I trust, bang, like, like uh, from my heart. And I could see the, the light. In wow. The I didn't know what it is. We prayed for healing. Yes, we did. Yeah. See, I'm telling you, Friday night prayers are powerful. And Things are happening, shifting, because the atmosphere is very different. You got healed without even praying for healing. You got healed kidney stone without even praying for it. My hand was 30 years crooked. Hmm. I was praising God because somebody else was healed and my hand became crooked. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So you see, sometimes healings can happen in an atmosphere. So you, you come for prayer, you come, and, and you're not even praying for yourself. Yeah. I remember one time, uh, a long time back, somebody said, you st when you start praying for the kingdom, right, God will start doing things for you that you never asked for. Amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added. So there are things that sometimes you're not even praying for, and they are getting answered because you're now focused on the kingdom. So with your children, focus on the kingdom. Praise God for your testimony. And, uh, I have to finish off the way that if my both kidneys were uh, fixed at yeah. the same time, I would be somewhere in Europe traveling. I wouldn't even be here. Wow. Here. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. <coughs> So you see, God did not cause the sickness, but he allowed it to, mm -mm, mm, let me hold on from healing him so that he sticks around for a while. And then, you know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna affect him too much. It's not gonna kill him, but it's just gonna, you know, bother him a little, <laughs> a little bit that he keeps seeking after me. Sometimes it's like that. And then God, it went from, from bad to worse. Mm. When the stone was cracked to three pieces, yeah. I was told not to go to far, be all the times on the phone, go to emergency, mm. because once, uh, you know, the sharp edges start yeah. bite, biting and it's possible, the only thing is to do surgery. Wow. So I was like, okay, God, what's next? <laughs> Praise God for your healing. Praise God. Amen. Amen. So through it all, persevere. Be patient. God will come through for you. Okay, certain things you have to discern. Lord, <coughs> is it a spirit? Is it the stubbornness of heart? What is it? And certain things can only be broken by prayer and fasting. Okay, remember everything, but go into prayer and fasting. <coughs> prayer and fasting. With that, I will finish. The Lord has asked me to go on us as a church on a 21 day prayer and fasting for revival okay things have to shift now it's not continuous everybody 21 days okay so we can take turns to pray continuously for 21 days so i'm not going to ask you guys to go 21 days far <laughs> if you guys can fast two days three days and if we can keep the prayer chain going Okay, all right, so if you're interested in the next, uh, we'll start from Sunday, yep. okay, um, we will give you, you can say, okay, Pastor, I'm going to go from this to this, this to this, and then we'll constantly somebody will be praying, and it doesn't have to be the whole day fast as well, okay, if you can miss one meal, two meals, oh, okay, uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you can, okay, <coughs> not eat the whole day and finish off in the night. Great. Okay. But something to break free from. Okay. So if you're not used to fasting, I encourage you. I encourage you to fast. You will love it. Okay. If you can fast for three days, no food. Great. If you can fast two days, no food. Great. One day, no food. Great. If you say, Pasa, I'll fast three days, but let me break in the night. Dinner fine no problem as long as you alert at least one or two hours every day to pray for the church 
for the ministry, for revival, for our nation. That's all. We only want to be praying for that 21 days. Okay? So we'll, we'll have more details soon. And then I'll probably, for those who are not, in, I think many of them have gone overseas, I'll probably make a video and put it on YouTube so you guys can uh, be in touch as well with what's happening. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you. Teach us your ways, O oh Lord. Thank you for the word. Thank you for your spirit that is constantly guiding us and building us. We give you all the glory, Lord. Have your way. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray, Lord, that your hand of grace be upon each and every one of your people. Cover them with your precious blood. They will continue to grow in faith and grace. And the burden of the kingdom will constantly grow stronger. The fire of God will constantly grow in their hearts. That they will be hungry for the things of the kingdom, the things of God. We submit, we surrender, O oh Lord. I pray that this week is a week of victory in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for everyone going overseas for missions, people going overseas for missions and people who have been away, Lord. I pray your hand of grace be upon them, Lord. Cover them with your precious blood. Lord, I pray that this fast we submit and surrender into your hands. Give us all the strength to fast and pray for the 21 days. For your glory to hit our city, Lord. We bless you. We thank you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.